Okay. Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. We are considering, uh, further considering our uh, deliberations on H-183, an act relating to sexual violence. Uh, let's see, we're going to um, turn back to disability rights and then we'll go to the uh, Defender General's office and then to the network. Uh, okay, great. Welcome, Zachary, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. Just one response um, to Rory's comment um, about the issue of adding disability language to uh, section 352B2. Um, I think his point is well taken that the vulnerable adult statute covers um, similar link, similar um, you know, uh, issues. I, we do think it is different. And just the, the one comment I would make is um, well, we definitely defer to, to Rory and other prosecutors on this issue, because they'll be the ones applying this to cases. Um, we have found, uh, and our concern is that in our statewide work on this, we have found that generally prosecutors are, are hesitant to rely on the vulnerable adult statute, and particularly if that section, subsection D in there is the only thing that they feel that they could possibly use, um, because that one is not as clear as the others, and it's a lot harder to prove. Um, we've just found that if that's all they can rely on, they generally don't rely, don't don't, don't bring that um, that charge. And so we think that this bill that we're, being, that we're discussing here is a bit more universally applicable. Um, and so including that disability language in the bill, I think would be helpful for people with disabilities overall. Um, but again, we defer to the prosecutors on that, but just wanted to raise that comment in terms of how we see it used around the state. Okay, great. Thank you, I appreciate that. Any questions before we move on? Any questions for Zachary? No. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, Rebecca Turner, Defender General's Office. Good morning. Good morning, good morning everyone. Um, for the record, Rebecca Turner from the Office of the Defender General's Office. Uh, so I wanted to start in on, um, just taking my notes here responding to uh, the state's attorney's testimony on uh, the suggestion of removing or adding a should have known component to this bill. And as I've testified before, the uh, that is the most significant and substantial change being made and proposed here to this life imprisonment statute. I've said before that that creates a strict liability offense. And what I mean by that is that it removes by using the disjunctive there, or uh, you permit a conviction to happen if a reasonable person, if a should have known, if an objectively uh, objectively viewed uh, should have been uh, should have known that that's enough. Now, the state's attorney testified today that that language should have known. Um, in, is included in other jurisdictions. I'm not here to dissect other jurisdictions, but the reference was made to the Vermont statute uh, pertaining to stalking, which I can address. And he, um, he indicated that the should have known language, again, the objective standard, again, not a subjective mens rea requirement of what the person is thinking at the time, but what someone reasonably should have known. I, that that should have known language is in our current stocking statute. Now, that is technically correct. The should have known is part of the definition, but let me walk through what the stocking statute actually requires. And that is, I count at least two mens rea requirements and the objective should have known language. So what we have there is several, uh, several checks, several requirements for stocking, which is 131062, uh, the legislature has defined that or established the crime of stalking as someone who intentionally stalks another person. So how do we know what stalking means? Uh, we're referred to a separate statute and that is 131061 subsection four where the definition of stalking there. So first we have intentionally stalk. Now we go to what does stalking require? It requires purposeful engagement in a course of conduct it's another purposeful is another intent, and then engaging in a course of conduct at a specific person. That's where you get embedded in there 
also the additional requirement of a should have known. It's a really tricky uh, charge in, um, to raise or understand even because of the multiple layers of that. Now, all of that I want, just wanna point out to is required for stocking two mens reas at least, along with the objective standard should have known. And what's the max punishment for that stocking statute? It's a misdemeanor offense. That is max two years punishment. Let's go back and focus to this sex assault life imprisonment max offense, strict liability. There is no precedent in this state in Title 13 to have the mens rea removed entirely. Um, now, when you combine that with, with, with a life imprisonment offense, certainly we don't even have that for the misdemeanor uh, offense here of stalking. When you combine that with the expanded definition of what it, const what it means to have no consent. And this latest version um, defining incapable of consenting, every time I see another draft of this, it just gets more and more broad in terms of what lawful conduct is potentially covered here. And also how much harder it is for a person who's engaging in lawful act or thinks they're engaging in a lawful sex act, how that captures inadvertent unlawful act so that you can't know in any given moment what is in fact lawful and unlawful and subject to a life imprisonment offense. Again, in criminal law, we have these fundamental requirements of notice. Excuse me. And, and so that even though I understand the, the several uh, motivations underlying this, this bill, it is just a fundamental premise that we need to know what uh, conduct is illegal so that we can have notice before we engage and try to engage in lawful activity. But as it stands, the current writing includes and captures lawful activity. Um, I wanted to also specifically address a question from a representative on substantial impairment. Now, the state's attorney in his testimony said that the Supreme Court interprets terms um, when they're not otherwise defined or linked to a specific definition by looking to common understanding. And then what the state's attorney did was turn to the Black's Law Dictionary. Now the Black's Law Dictionary is not a readily accessible dictionary that people out in public have, I do. Um, but I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an appellate nerd and a, and a lawyer. Um, so what, in fact, we do have the arguments about what is uh, commonly understood the terms, but we don't turn to the Black Law Dictionary. We look at Webster's, uh, Merriam-Webster's. We look at others. And when you look at that definition I just pulled up for substantial online, Merriam-Webster's substantial. The definition of substantial consists of relating to a substance. It's important, it's essential. It's not imaginary or illusory, it's real, it's true. Now, I, I, I don't, these are not helping me understand what substantial as opposed to substantial impairment means. Now, we do have the help that we have considerable DUI law, which requires impairment. Now, we know that uh, charges and arrests are are supported by allegations of impairment. What do they, what do the uh, police officers and prosecution point to as evidence? Watery eyes, red eyes, nervousness. Um, I've seen not, not uh, shaking an ash off of a cigarette uh, timely enough, too much ash at the end of the cigarette. Uh, uh, you know, basically all sorts of factors can come into to develop and, and support an allegation of impairment. Now here, the question back to the representative that posed to the state's attorney that I like to take a stab at. And, and as I understood the question, what happens if both parties go out, well, I'm adding here, go out for a drink, go out for a date, go out to dinner and have some drinks and both parties become or fall within the definition of whatever that means, substantial impairment. Uh, how can that be used if the person who's accused, who's substantially impaired, how can that be used as a defense uh, at the later uh, trial? Now, if you take out the mens rea requirement and just have the should have known, it can't come in. You can't argue 
I, 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 I couldn't know because I, I was substantially impaired. It just is something that is not part of the equation. So that's not factored in. So I just, I just wanted to add that uh, angle um, perspective to, to that question and answer. I think that that is all that I have for the, uh, my comments at this time. And I'll take a pause. Are there any mm -hmm. questions? Thank you. Uh, giving committee members a minute to either raise their hands or, or jump in. Kate. Thanks. Um, I, don't, I don't even know if this is a question or a comment. I guess what keeps coming to mind for me um, Rebecca, when I hear your testimony, which I which I really appreciate, um, is I, I guess what keeps going to mind for me when I hear your testimony is reflecting on like, well then let's re-examine what the um, potential punishment of the crime is versus not pursuing a bill like this. How do I want to say this? The testimony on this bill started with some pretty alarming numbers in terms of how rarely um, people receive justice when they have been victimized. And so what keeps coming to mind for me when I'm hearing this testimony is, you know, we need to have this high bar, um, which I, I understand fundamentally, but the court, like the, the, the justice system is failing people in this situation. And so it, it, it feels a little like, I'm trying to get my thoughts in order around this, but it just feels confusing to me a little bit to be saying, well, look, this is how the justice system works. We need to have this really high bar, but the way the justice system is working on this particular issue is not working. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm just, I'm feeling conflicted about, about this type of testimony um, because I feel like it doesn't help address the fundamental reason why this bill is in front of us, which is people are being harmed in significant ways and the system is failing them. Um, so I, again, I don't know if that's a comment, I don't know if it's a question, but I just felt compelled to, to say that. Appreciate um, you sharing those thoughts, and and I think my response, or maybe it's further questions, because I wasn't, I'm not recalling the numbers that that um, that were brought up during, you know, in the context of this bill specifically, and and I'm not necessarily privy to what what numbers are are in your head. What I what I think about, and I actually didn't respond, but I heard State's Attorney uh, Thibault talk about, um, well maybe make a, a reference to how difficult it is to prosecute these cases from, from a defender's perspective and specifically from an appellate defender's perspective uh, where we're seeing cases after conviction of sex assault. Now I'm just talking about sex assault, right? Because there are a whole slew of possible offenses that could fit any, any, uh, any of the scenarios that potentially are, are wanting to be addressed here, right? But in terms of, of, of the sexual assault statute uh, and the prosecutions, I don't know if someone has presented numbers to this committee as to how many are actually charged, how many result in convictions, how many of those are appealed, and how many of those are reversed. I don't know if you've heard those tangible numbers. I think that would be giving you some objective data in terms of knowing how much um, is this is this is not this is failing. And if 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 they're looking at that, where where are those? What is what is happening there? Um, very few sexual assault convictions are reversed uh, on appeal by the Vermont Supreme Court, um, and that I hope is not due to uh, my appellate division shop shoddy work quality. I think instead what it, what it reflects is that we have extraordinarily uh, expansive, uh, um, it's, 
definitions already on how, on how to prove no consent, right? Um, and, and so that, that has not been a difficult bar uh, to, for the prosecutors to have to prove. Again, I don't know, having not, uh, clearly not included in the numbers that maybe you're, you're talking about, but again, to the extent that it's as to convictions, charges versus convictions versus final convictions on appeal upon review, I don't know how many of those are being ultimately reversed. Um, so I, I think that the problem here is that by trying to in broaden the elements even more than they currently are, you see how you quickly run up against sort of the ceiling. You're already there. This, this sexual assault statute is already being interpreted and has been, the elements are so broad that I just, I, I, I throw the question back to the committee members. I, I, I don't know where that line is between lawful and unlawful sexual conduct with this bill. And when, and, and, that, and fundamentally that's the notice problem, um, particularly given with this life imprisonment uh, offense. Thank you. Uh, not, not seeing any other hands. So thank you, Rebecca, appreciate it. Uh, Sarah Robinson, good morning, welcome. Good morning, thank you for having me. For the record, Sarah Robinson from the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Very much appreciate the conversation that has uh, taken place this morning and the, the testimony um, to date. I'm going to be brief and I'm just going to speak about two items. Um, I, I wanted to, to speak briefly about the conversation that um, Attorney Turner and um, others were just having and reiterate that um, the addition of, of substantial in our view, um, we support that language. Um, and we do think, frankly, that it, it helps clarify um, that line between um, lawful and unlawful sexual conduct. And of the total number of sexual assaults, this is according to the Department of Justice, 23% of them are ever reported. Of those reported, only 20% lead to arrest and less than 1% of cases ultimately lead to a conviction. So it is really exceedingly rare that these cases even ever make it to trial um, or lead to, lead to a conviction. And the stories that we hear about when we, um, our member organizations work with survivors or survivors are seeking medical care um, in the wake of an assault um, in regards to impairment are, are so far outside of two people, you know, going out to dinner and having a few glasses of wine. The cases we hear about are people who are completely unable to respond um, due to impairment. And that is those are really the cases that we believe that this bill will be exceptionally helpful in providing more tools to ensure that those cases can be captured and when survivors do choose to report um, that the statute is able to respond to the facts of the case accordingly. And on uh, the revised language that you see regarding data collection, I just wanted to note that um, it's exactly the, the sort of data that the committee was just speaking about that it would be really helpful to have a statewide picture of. So we have a wealth of national statistics um, and we certainly have snapshots of how the judicial system does not work well for survivors of sexual assault here in Vermont. And uh, we hear from survivors themselves about how that process doesn't go well often and where in the process those cases break down um, or frankly their participation in that process becomes uh, equally traumatizing to the assault that they experienced. But the statistical report will really help us direct future systems reforms to the places in the system where we see case attrition happening and be able to understand what the trends are here in Vermont. Um, so we're very glad to see this revised language and believe that this will be very helpful in the long run in being able to diagnose uh, where, where the system isn't working and where we might um, direct future efforts. 
And I would just say we're, we're supportive of the bill and we're very grateful for all the time that the committee has spent on it. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, any questions for Sarah? My understanding is that at, uh, either right now or, or shortly uh, from, from now that House Government Operations will be looking at the council section of the bill because uh, that really is in, um, in their jurisdiction. I, I know that both the education and government operation chairs uh, have spoken and decided that government operations will, will take a look at it. Uh, actually, I see Martin's hand. Yeah, this is actually, I wanted to circle back to uh, State's Attorney Thiebaud as well. It just, <clears throat> the, the issue keeps on coming back up with the reasonably should have known uh, component really being a, a focus of concern. And, and I have expressed some concern in the past and have received some more information <clears throat> about other states that have uh, gone with this. But, but uh, you know, Rory, if you're able to, how would this play out? How do you know of other cases in other, in other uh, jurisdictions or your experience on, on how this actually would play out as far as the reasonably should have known standard in this kind of a criminal offense? Sure, so I'll start with a, a 20,000 foot view on that. So the statute is the starting point for how a jury or a fact finder considers a case. Uh, there's a Jury instructions are really, you know, what where the rubber meets the road, and that is, the instructions are put in simple to understand lay terms based upon the statutes, applicable case law, to ascertain that standard. Um, Vermont has a, a standing uh, committee that does uh, provide model uh, jury instructions for us, and in looking at other states that have adopted similar language, these instructions have been developed, have been tested, and I did just for you know the record, I did just send out. Um, uh, to Representative Lalonde, um, two cases I found really quickly from other jurisdictions that have similar language. Um, on the fly, it's not probably the best research, but just showing that they do pass constitutional muster. In, in terms of ascertaining where that standard is, I, I think that Sarah Robinson's comments are on point, that it, typically what we're dealing with are people who are at the point of virtually uh, you know, no, no cognitive ability remaining. While there may be some nominal consciousness, they're not there. And uh, you know, as an example that I think many will probably recall, it was not a Vermont case, fortunately, but um, it, going back now, four or five years ago, the case of Brock Turner really shocked the nation. And that was an intoxicated woman who was being held up by Mr. Turner uh, by at a dumpster. So while she um, probably was opening her eyes at various points in time, could make noises and respond to external stimuli, she was not in a state of mind where she could provide consent using the Brock Turner uh, situation as an example. Um, I think any of us looking at that situation would say that that woman was not in a position to know, appreciate, or understand what was happening to her or make a conscious or deliberate decision about whether she consented. Um, it should be no excuse that, you know, Brock Turner in that situation, for example, would claim just blanketly that, well, no, she wanted to. Well, that's not really the standard. If it's a subjective standard, then of course the person who is committing the offense is always going to think that they're entitled to take that from the victim or do what they want to do. And unfortunately, uh, when it comes to, I think, an issue of body autonomy such as this and uh, basic human dignity and decency when it comes to sexual relations, we should apply an objective standard. Um, I, I mentioned previously that in Washington County, we have a case pending right now that involves a young woman who was vomiting at a toilet because of alcohol consumption. And while she's laying next to the toilet, that is when she was sexually assaulted. I think to any reasonable person, that would be a circumstance where that is not an invitation for sexual activities. That is not somebody who is in a position to consent. At the end of the day, I think it's important to note that our criminal justice system relies upon peers. These are peers from our community. 12 jurors, just as much as this committee of, uh, I think 12, has expressed a range of opinions or views about what is or is not the line, so too would those individuals uh, on a jury interpreting instructions provided by the court. Every case is different, facts are unique, but this I think is a both constitutionally sufficient framework 
and provide sufficient specificity to understand the use of in terms incapable of consenting, of substantial impairment, all elevate this, that it's not just something of under the influence. If it were, we could just say, well, you can't have sex under the influence. There'd be probably a lot of objections around the state for that, uh, but that's not the standard. It's not a criminal standard here in other jurisdictions, and it shouldn't be the standard. Rather, what we're endeavoring to do, I think, is to ensure that there is a clear line where intoxication becomes incapacity. And incapacity is fairly well defined, both in this proposed statute, in other jurisdictions, and certainly in other uh, interpretations. Again, I think one of the benefits of borrowing this language largely from federal sources is to be able to allow and enable Vermont courts to look outside to persuasive legal authority in federal contexts of how these definitions are interpreted. To go it alone or create our own, you know, sort of unique phraseology for this would leave courts scrambling to, you know, start from scratch. And I think that's, again, one of the key benefits here. We're not doing that. And we can look to um, neighboring jurisdictions and our um, federal jurisdiction to help us. Again, as I mentioned the first time I testified, right now, uh, there are individuals who are either on some form of military duty who are subject to this type of definition. And certainly, uh, if there was occasion for a federal sexual assault uh, cause of action to be brought here in the state of Vermont, maybe someone moving across state lines or, or some other federal nexus, let's say, uh, that would be the standard applied. So as of this moment, there are Vermonters who are already subject to this standard. So uh, I think that it is not um, it's large due process concern. To Representative Donnelly's comment, I would agree that if there is concern about the life offense being attached to subpart B2, then we could perhaps look to uh, treating this akin to how statutory rape is treated when it's based upon a should have known standard limiting exposure to 20 years. I think a survey and maybe Robin Joy could provide this data or someone from uh, CRG, very few of, um, very few sex assault cases end with sentences uh, with life as a max it does happen, but many more are in term years and are often below the 20 years. So, uh, but that's a policy decision. And um, ultimately my main concern is just having clarity and definitions and their ability to ensure we're best serving uh, justice. I, I appreciate that. Um, so I guess the big uh, difference from a lot of other criminal offenses is we're talking about an objective standard here. The reasonableness standard is objective. So it's not going into the, the uh, criminal defendant's uh, state of mind, particularly. Uh, it's, it's what would an objectively reasonable person uh, perceive in that situation. So just a follow-up question in that situation, the situation where you have two people who are very intoxicated and is there an object, I mean, how does the objective reasonableness standard go to the perpetrator who is as intoxicated and really in their state of mind wouldn't have known one thing or another as far as the consent of the, uh, of the victim? Well, so I'll offer one thing. So uh, Ms. Turner, when discussing the stalking statute indicated that there are multiple mens reas, so too are there within uh, sex assault statute. First of all, there has to be a knowing uh, sexual act. Uh, so if we look at, for example, a female victim with a male uh, perpetrator, and it's a sexual act, meaning there's a penetrative action, that male at some point forms a specific intent to engage in that sexual act with the female victim. So that's step one. You have a specific intent to engage in that sexual act. Um, you know, there may be, I guess in the context of L and L or two people laying together, there may be context where there's sort of touching that maybe that be in, intentional, which could be sorted out, but it seems very unlikely that there's ever a circumstance where someone accidentally penetrates another person. So meaning there is some specific desire to do that as a threshold. Then the question becomes, was that with or without consent? And that's why I think there is the ability to apply an objective standard. In my previous material submitted to the committee, I think on the second uh, hearing, I provided an excerpt from uh, the United States Army Military Judges Bench Book. That's really just the, the book that judges within that system use to provide instructions to the jury. My personal experience with it is it's well created, 
generally because uh, there's a standardization across jurisdictions everywhere from Southeast Asia back to you know continental United States. So as a geographically dispersed uh, jurisdiction, consistency is incredibly important. Those instructions do uh, go into detail about how jurors should be informed of that, how to consider the voluntary intoxication of uh, an offender. Um, but at the end of the day, since we're dealing with sexual act in this context, it all begins with some specific sexual act for which there's a specific intent. Um, and when making that call to engage in a penetrative sexual act with another, uh, I think that comes with it that it should be done under an objectively reasonable circumstance. Again, uh, when someone is drunk and lying by a toilet or having to be held up by a at a dumpster, uh, it seems incredibly unlikely that reasonable people would believe that that individual was acquiescing, acceding to, or consenting to sexual activity. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Chief Pete, please. Welcome. Welcome, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. I, it looks like I, uh, I believe I'm having uh, some, some camera issues. It's uh, telling me the camera has failed to start, so I apologize for that. Um, and good morning, uh, representatives, members of the committee. Um, my name is Brian Pete. I'm with the Montpelier Police Department, and, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, and can answer any questions that maybe uh, that you may have for me. Uh, I would just uh, pretty much echo the sentiment of, um, of uh, the Vermont State Police regarding this, that, that this would be something I think that uh, that I would and, and other chiefs of police within the state uh, can, can definitely uh, get on board with and do our part to, uh, to, um, to meet this. And then just in, um, and again, looking at, uh, and, and, I, and I know that this has already been spoken about, but just uh, the, how, how we collect the data and, and, and uh, going forward, and as well as um, looking at processes for um, uh, establishing processes to find data or to collect the data for um, other items that may be of interest in the uh, in the future and moving forward. And with that, I'd, I'd stand ready to answer any questions folks may have. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Just looking to see if we have any questions. Oh. Looks a minute. No, yeah, great. Well, thank you and uh, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you, Okay. Uh, David Chair, Attorney General's Office. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office for the record. Um, we are supportive of the latest draft uh, that was posted. Um, I believe that is draft 2.3 and it incorporates a number of changes that I believe we had actually already discussed and that we had worked on with State's Attorney Tebow. I know it also incorporates some changes around the data collection and reporting, which are also items we've worked on with stakeholders and are certainly supportive of those changes as well. I know there's been a lot of back and forth today about some of the legal issues. I, I don't think that I could do a better job than has already been done uh, by State's Attorney Tebow of engaging on some of those issues. And I, I defer to uh, the state's attorney on on those answers. We don't have disagreement on those. I know that there'd been a, a brief discussion about um, addressing mental, physical, or developmental impairment in this law. I also we do agree with state's attorney Tebow, and I want to express sensitivity to the fact that I don't have particular expertise on this issue. Although I appreciate state's attorney Tebow's. Uh, uh, giving me some credit there, I, I do want to give credit where it's due, which is to the chief of our criminal division, Domenica Padula, who does have some expertise on these issues. And I certainly understand the concern and potential frustration around the vulnerable adult statute potentially not being used as much as it should that I've heard expressed uh, today. Um, but I, I, I do agree, and it is our office's position that we agree that uh, it is more, these are very complex issues, issues that in, intersect with bodily autonomy and um, a, as well as appropriate venues for prosecution and making sure that these sensitive issues have a body of case law and carefully considered statute behind them. So we do agree with State's Attorney Tebow that uh, the vulnerable, vulnerable adult statute remains the appropriate 
place in statute to deal with some of these issues. Um, and we also, I, you know, I hear today the concern that that may not be being used as much as it should be or where it might be appropriate. And I think that is a matter of education and making sure that both law enforcement and state's attorneys are fully aware of the tools that are available to keep people safe. And certainly that's something that our office would be happy to work with other, other stakeholders on ensuring that the tools that we have available are being used and where appropriate and where effective. And other than that, happy to take any questions if there are any. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, just looking to see if anybody has any, any questions. Okay. Uh, I am not seeing any. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody who's here to testify, but I um, I think that uh, I think that is it for now. So um, I'm going to switch gears. <laughs> uh, committee, we uh, might have an amendment on H195 and I'm hoping that David doesn't go too far. Uh, I am going to see if I can reach Representative China to see if he can come to committee now. Um, Barbara, you're with, um, you're still here for half an hour or so, right? I am. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so let's take a, um, I don't know, five minute stretch break while I try to reach Representative China so we can hear from him and address that. David, does that work for you? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I, I'm supposed to be elsewhere at 1115, but I can push that a little bit if I need to and uh, and I'll be here for that and I'm happy to connect. I'm not sure if Representative China will be presenting an amendment, but happy to connect on that uh, as needed. Okay, yeah, and I appreciate that. And we'll, we'll hear that from him. Okay, so um, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you.